everyone has the same five core areas of their life that ultimately determine how happy they'll be. Unfortunately, most of us have developed failure habits in each, and it's Will Moore's mission to help replace those with success habits to maximize momentum. After exiting his business for a combined nine-figure sum, Will learned it's not just about becoming an entrepreneur of your career, but an entrepreneur of the most important business you'll ever run, your life. And to crush it in your life requires firing on all cylinders in your five cores by continually taking action, building habits, and maintaining balance in each. Hello, and welcome to the Five Core Life Podcast with Will Moore, founder of More Momentum. If you've not already, please make sure to follow and subscribe to the Five Core Life Podcast wherever you're listening or watching this so that you get notified when episodes air every week. If you happen to be on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. It helps others find the podcast and gives us valuable feedback. On today's episode of the Five Core Life, Will Moore is interviewed on the M&A Unplugged podcast with Dominic Rinaldi. If you're looking to maximize the value of your business acquisition or sale, the M&A Unplugged podcast was designed with you in mind. On each episode of the M&A Unplugged, Dominic Rinaldi interviews business buyers, sellers, and their advisors, and you will hear first-hand accounts of their transaction experience. You'll gain valuable insights and actionable takeaways so you can maximize the value of your business acquisition or sale. On today's episode, Dominic Rinaldi and Will Moore sit down to discuss doorstep delivery. Many business owners who sell their business wind up being remorseful, not because of the amount of money that they received for their business, but actually because they don't know the next thing to do and have lost their purpose. So are you ready to step aside from your business personally, financially, and emotionally? If you want to learn how to prepare for the sale and avoid some of the common fitball pitfalls when selling, then today's interview with Will Moore of More Momentum is for you. And if you happen to recognize Dominic Rinaldi's name, that's because he was on episode 43 of the Five Core Life podcast. So please be sure to check that one out as well. Are you ready to fire on all cylinders? If so, let's go. Hey, Will, welcome to M&A Unplugged. Thank you very much, kind sir. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really so interested in getting into your story, unpacking what you've done and what you're doing today. But before we do all of that, could you start with a quick backgrounder on yourself so the audience understands who you are and where you've come from? Absolutely. So, uh, crazy childhood, born in California. My parents were hippies, moved to Hawaii. Um, for five years, Honolulu. Then we moved to Bethesda, Maryland, D.C. Um, then we, I, I ended up going to school in Winter Park, Florida. Uh, I was working, I was selling land. Real estate was kind of where I got early started. And we, this company was crazy. It was like a modern day far and away, the movie, where it was literally like these parts, it was during the, the boom and everything was just going nuts. And we would have these one day blowout sales in the middle of nowhere. And we'd sell five to 20 acre parcels. And they would just sell out in like two minutes, you know, like hundreds of parcels. This is back, you know, 2006, 2000, right before things crashed with the real estate boom. But so one of the things I noticed is we were stuck in this office because the phones were always ringing off the hook. There were only 12 of us land consultants. We could not leave sometimes for 12 to 15 hours and, you know, barely enough time to go to the bathroom, let alone eat food. And so pizza and Chinese was the regular staple Back then, that's all there was, um, which is kind of how it had been for years and years and years. And we thought there's got to be, or I thought, I guess, there's, there's got to be something better. And there wasn't. So as soon as the real estate market turned on a dime and we had that crash, um, I'd already been thinking about this starting a, a restaurant delivery service. As people now know it, a, a Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash type of business. At the time, none of these were even Twinkles. Uh, in, the, in these owners' eyes, and there was really nothing nationally um, because the technology wasn't there. I mean, it was basically at the time, it, iPhones literally just came out that same year we started the company. Wow. And so I was like, you know what? I need to do something. I want to be able to order, you know, good food. I want my sushi. I want my Thai food. I want my Indian. I want to be able to get salads. And so I grabbed my buddy who I was working with at the company and we got together, started it up, and just did, never looked back. Wow, that's unbelievable. Uh, 
and started before any of these other platforms were there. And so you were groundbreaking in the sense, were there other folks around the country that you knew were doing it in a small way? So you had some model to follow? So, yes. So there, there was, there was places called like telephone taxi and, you know, I, you know, right now that was, this was also right when the internet was starting to really take off and you could kind of look things up. And so I was looking up and seeing, you know, in a small little city, they'd have a place called tell, you know, call in your order. And then I was like, well, what's the dispatcher doing? You know, who, who's, how's the driver finding their way there? Are they using like a, a Mac? And so, you know, we basically kind of had to really just figure out a lot of the stuff out on our own. And at first we actually bought our drivers. You know, at first we only had one or two drivers including me and, and my business partner. And, you know, we all got, we got five Garmin GPSs and we gave them to the drivers and we said, Hey, you know, when we get an order that comes in, our dispatcher's going to call you, give you the address, you then pull over to the side of the road, enter the address and then go to the, you know, your destination. And it was just very archaic. But as I said, right then is when the iPhone came out. So it was like perfect timing because very quickly, you know, people realized they could use their, we could, we could tie our software into the phones to where it sent the order directly to them. They got the order on their phone. They hit a button. It gave them directions to where they needed to go. It showed them all the info they needed for the order. So that was kind of the game changer. Yeah, that's people. amazing. And and you sold that business. You 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 rolled it up into something that then got you know part of a bigger uh, entity, and then that got sold. And now you're off doing something else. And I'm looking forward to having you share that journey with everybody. But I can't ignore the fact that you went from California to Hawaii to Virginia to Florida. I mean, that's amazing. You <laughs> moved around. Yeah, my, my grandfather was actually a general in World War II and the Korean War. So my mom moved around quite a bit. And Honolulu was one of the places she was stationed. Um, and, you know, when she rebelled and became a hippie, my dad became a hippie first. They both came from these very structured backgrounds and they both yeah, rebelled. rebelled my, grandpa, yeah. my dad grabbed my mom and said, let's go. And my, my grandfather boycotted the wedding. It was this big, big <laughs> to do. And, you know, didn't talk to my mom for 10 years um, because, you know, she married a hippie and he was, you know, this, this general. But as they just started their journey, they thought, okay, well, where's a great place to be hippies and just live off the land? And, yeah. you know, Hawaii was right to the top of the tough list. Tough duty, tough duty there. Yeah, right. right. My sister lived in a van for the first two years of her oh life. And I was fortunate enough when I was born, uh, about six months later, we moved into this very tiny little apartment. In oh, wow. Awesome. Hey, so let's get into you. you so you, you grab a buddy, you're building this company. Did you build it with the intent that you were going to build something up and then sell it? Or what, what was your thinking when you started the business? So... I read a book literally right at that time called Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm. by Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. I'm sure you, uh, you and a lot of your listeners are, are familiar. It was a game changer for me. And then it got my mind thinking of passive income genera generating, you know, here I am working for every dollar. And, and I saw how the wealth get truly wealthy is they generate passive income and they get their money working for them and they use the law of compounding. And, that, and I said, okay, I need to get that going. And so when I had this business idea, around the same time, I actually started getting into real estate as well, because that's a big focus of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and so I started buying these little property. I, I got a loan, I bought a property, and it turns out very serendipitously, the college I went to, Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, there, was a ton of, there wasn't enough housing on campus, so there was a ton of students looking for housing. So I actually started renting these things out, and I was generating enough income over what my mortgage was to where I was actually able to sustain my living at some point. So that's how I was able to quit my job at Florida Land Partners where I was selling land, and I had enough money coming in to sort of get me through to start this other business. And at the time, I just, you know, there was this huge demand. I, I knew that people wanted food. And, and, and my buddy and I just said, look, man, it's either now or never. Let's take a chance. And so that's what we did. That's awesome. And so you spent how long operating that business before, uh, and I think it was you were approached, right, by this other company that had plans of doing a national roll-up of, of uh, food delivery Companies? So actually, it's a good question. So we're humming along for 
about seven years, hardly any competition, any competition that came in was, you know, these little players and we squashed them like bugs. You know, we're self-funded. We didn't, we didn't do, we didn't raise any money or get any venture capital. We did it ourselves because we, we'd heard the, I'd read enough books and knew the horror stories about how if you give somebody control of your company, it could be a nightmare. And so we bootstrapped it and it was very tough for the first couple of years, but then we started to make a profit and we were actually a profitable business. Then around year seven is when the Grubhubs and the Uber Eats and Amazon for a while even had their own delivery service, uh, you know, Postmates, all these companies started appearing with billions of dollars and, you know, losing money hand over fist in order to gain market share. And I looked at my partner and I, I was just said, you know what, the writing's on the wall here, buddy. Like, there's no way we are going to be able to compete long term with this. We had, we had a great run. We had a great business model. But now they're all coming into our territories. At this point, we've grown into 19 branches throughout the Southeast. So we had Orlando was our first one that we started. And then we were all over Florida, you know, Miami, Tampa, uh, all, the, all, the, all the big cities in Florida. And then we were also up in Nashville and tennis, areas in Tennessee and South Carolina and Denver. So we were, we'd grown. We, were, we had franchised. We had corporate locations. And one of our crossovers happened to be with this gentleman in Miami, this company called Bite Squad. And we, we, were, we were running ours and they were running theirs and they were competition, but I always had a friendly relationship with the other owner. And when I saw all these companies opening up, I immediately got on the phone and cause I remember him saying, you know, you should keep in touch and maybe one day we'll, you know, even consolidate kind of, there was a little bit of talk of that. And I just said, look, man, we got to do something here. You guys are similar sized as us. They were based out of Minneapolis. Um, they were doing about 35 million at the time we were doing about 40 million at the time, 40 million a year. And I said, you know, let's, what do you think? And he got his partner on and we discussed it within a day. We're like, let's make this happen. And they also had better software than us, which was huge because all these new companies coming out had really good software. And that was the differentiator, you know, the user experience, you're using your phone at, by this point, as I said, you know, the iPhone had come out the, the year we did it. Now it's like, Five, five, six, seven years later, and it, it, was a, it was a science. And certain companies that were spending the most on the software and the user experience were ex excelling, and they had a really good one. So that's how that kind of started. We got together, and we basically formed this partnership. Wow. And so was it a merger of equals, or were they the majority? How did that, how did that transaction? So we transpire? ended up agreeing to let them be the majority, so it was like 51 49 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, we called it a partnership, but really kind of the way we ended up structuring it was they essentially bought us with, um, with, with so they, they had raised, they had just raised money and they were planning on raising more. Mm -hmm. So they, they bought us with all, almost all stock and um, with the, with the notion that we all were on the same team, same, same uh, idea frame of, let's grow this. Let's put a bunch of money into it. Let's expand into these tier two and tier three markets, which were not the New York's, the LA's and the Chicago's, but the, you know, the Nashville's, the Orlando's, those ones that weren't on the big guys radars yet. Yeah, right. Sure. They were spending all their money going into the big ones. We said, let's, let's dominate these small ones. Cause we knew from experience that when a customer has a good experience, experience with us and they're a regular customer, they're not just going to switch just because they may go get it one order because they get a free order. But if they have a good experience with us, they're going to keep that. So that's what we did. And we just started growing. And then we, we raised more money. And we started picking up these smaller markets. And then eventually, we got on the radar of Waiter Holdings out of Louisiana. And they purchased us, uh, purchased us as a whole. Wow. And so let me go back to the actual transaction where you, you hooked up with Bike Squad. You, you, you do the transaction. You and your partner stayed with the business and in active roles and continued to, to operate actively? Yes. Yeah, so at first we did, um, we, we, we got titles, um, and I was, I was in mergers and acquisitions, um, conveniently the name of your show. So I was part of, uh, being one of the ones that went out and found these RDSs that were ripe for being purchased. And so that's, that was me and, and my partner, we were both doing that. And I'd already developed, you know, cause there's actually a restaurant delivery service convention that happens every year. I've been going to that for years. So I knew a bunch of uh, them already, mm -hmm. of these smaller mom and pop ones and these little cities that would be perfect 
to join our network. So I just started reaching out to all them. And I also you know, did some research on some other ones I hadn't met yet and started contacting them and was able to bring on several that way. Yeah. Awesome. So Will, I'm assuming that at this point in time, you had never really done a merger and acquisition when you started to talk to bike squad. Is that, is that correct? That's exactly correct. That's so right. how did you go about those negotiations and those discussions? Did you hire professionals? Did you seek advice from other folks? How did you know how to value your business? You know, what, where did you go to get all that information? So you felt comfortable at the end of the day that, you know, this was a good deal. It's a great question. So, you know, whenever you do something like this and it's a first time experience, you always have the hindsight of saying, Oh, I wish I'd known this or I wish I, so uh, without getting into any sticky details, we ended up not, it turns out making some of the best negotiating decisions that we could have. And we would have changed some because it ended up biting us slightly. Um, no pun intended, bite squad. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we still, we, we, we got through that. We had a very friendly relationship and when we did end up getting bought by waiter, everything was all puppy dogs and ice cream. But we, we, we were essentially relying on our attorney, um, who's a great attorney, but she wasn't super experienced in these either. Mm. And, you know, so she's, you know, they're, they're going through their con, you know, they wrote up the, con their attorney wrote the contract and then our attorney's going in and saying, well, this and this, but then there's always unforeseen things that you just, right. unless you've been doing it for a long time, don't really see. And so we did get hit with, with some of those. And, you know, I wish we hired an expert in M&A before. Yeah. We actually yeah. And you look at, and this is, you know, we all go through life and we learn lessons, right? And some of them are more painful than others. This worked out really well for you at the end of the day. But I think what we're, you're highlighting here is two things that I really talk to people about often after my decades of doing this are one, do some preparation in advance of, you know, doing a transaction. And secondly, hire people who are experts at M&A. And not just M&A professionals like myself, but the accountants and the attorneys. There's right. a big difference between an attorney who does a lot of real estate transactions and somebody who lives and breeds M&A transactions. I mean, the things that they get, they're faced with every day in the M&A world are not the same things that a real estate attorney or an estate attorney is going to be faced with. And so uh, it's a cautionary tale sometimes, but this all worked out for you. So that, that's awesome. It did. You know, we, we were fortunate to get to get bought um, by a waiter. And that was, that was, still wasn't an all cash deal. That ended up being ca half cash and half stock. So as of now, I'm still holding on. I haven't sold any. In fact, actually, it had quite a tumble. If you look at the history, it's WTRH is the symbol. It got very scary for, for, for a hot minute there. So we had a six month hold, which is standard. Yeah. Um, you know, when you get purchased, you can't trade your stock for about six months. Uh, we watched it go from 10 the day we closed, which was about February of 2019 last year, up to 15. And then it literally went all the way down to 33 cents at, at its low. And all this was when our hands were tied and we couldn't do anything because yeah. it was it, the company that bought us was not managing it the best. And they had turnover and it was taking longer for them to integrate the, our company with theirs and, and the expenses were just ballooning. And so the first couple quarters of earnings were just absolutely disastrous. And it was basically being, being priced as a bankrupt company. And mm -hmm. we were just beside ourselves, you know, it's my baby that I've worked my whole life for. And, you know, we can't now, you know, Oh, luckily we did at least get some cash. So, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, I had that, so that was good, but, um, you know, to watch your, your net worth go down that, that fast. So, but fortunately, um, they were able to turn things around this last quarter. They finally had a, a uh, they actually made money. They weren't expecting to make money until I think the end of this year. And they actually made a penny uh, per share. And so they had, the stock has come back quite a bit. I think it's, it's trading at around $4 or so now, which is still down from the 10, but way up from the 33. Cents. Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, they're only paper losses. So you keep your fingers crossed and hope it keeps going in the right direction. It seems like this is a segment that's not going anywhere, especially right now. I mean, uh, food delivery seems to be one of the big winners here during the pandemic. Yeah. 
It's red hot. Yeah. I mean, it's it, that, you know, right. I, there's fortunates, there's unfortunates. You've already heard some of the roller coaster yeah. and you got, you got to have a temperament. I mean, starting your own business and, and then selling it. I mean, you got to have like nerves of steel because if you let it get to you, you know, yeah. one day you're, you're, you're up here, you know, the day we sold, I'll never forget that feeling, you know, and it was amazing. And then watching it go down and it was just an awful feeling and then coming back up and then, you know, and it actually just went up to around $6 and now it's come back down to four. So, but at the end of the day, the reason I'm holding on my stock is it's a great segment. People are only ordering things more and more online. Amazon is an absolute unstoppable beast. Yeah. People are used to just hitting a few buttons and getting what they want. And food is one of those things. And it's, it's you know, I, I do think it's a great space to be in. Of course, the elephant in the room, you've got, you know, Grubhub and uh, really DoorDash are the two biggest competitors. But I don't know if you're familiar. So uh, Grubhub just got bought by a company called Just Eats out of mm -hmm. Europe. Yep. And uh, Uber Eats just bought Postmates, which is another competitor. They just bought Postmates. So now there's really only two real big ones and us. You know, we're, we're the third. We're, we're smaller than they are. But to me, that makes us a very compelling M&A target. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Can I talk just a little bit about um, <clears throat> the roll up strategy? So you took over the mergers and acquisitions role. You hadn't done that before. How many transactions did you actually complete? And, and talk a little bit about your experience there, because I think there's a lot of people in our audience who see growth through acquisition as a, you know, really viable growth alternative. So talk a little bit about your experience there. So it was, yeah, it was, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I just something in my DNA and, and the reason I started my own company and, and did my own things, I really like to call my own shots, work, work my own hours and work with people. And you, you know, if I can do something where I put those three together um, and, and, and if I'm selling something that I'm passionate about and truly believe in, I feel like I'm an unstoppable force. And so, you know, it, it wasn't, terribly difficult. I shouldn't say it wasn't terribly difficult. I mean, I probably talked to 200 companies and at the end of the day, maybe we got four or five of the ones I talked to on. Um, but you know, these were pretty big deals and you know, people, it was a very interesting experience because I'm reaching out on some of these people I knew, some of these people I didn't. And I'm basically saying the same thing that I was thinking when we rolled up, which was, look, I'm not here to try to put the scare tactics on you. That's not my style. But I'm telling you what I see and why we just rolled up and, and merged with another company. I see major roll-ups in this industry, and these guys are coming in hot. You know, right now, they may not be in your market, but they're going to make their way to the smaller markets, the Tier 2 and the Tier 3 cities very soon. And sure enough, I mean, this has been a couple of years that, you know, they are in most of these markets now. And unfortunately, some of the people that didn't come on with us, I know, have, have gone out of business. And, you know, it's very difficult to compete with that type of thing when, yeah. and you know, keeping the drivers is really like your biggest challenge. Like in the, these are independent contractors. You can't tell them what to do. You can't tell them they have to show up, but you need a certain amount of them in order to be able to get the food delivered hot and fresh and on time to your customers. Yeah. So let's say it's a rainy, it's a rainy night. You got 20 drivers, you need 30 drivers. You're going to get a lot of PO people that are getting their food late. Sometimes you'd have to then stack orders and you have, you know, multiple orders with one driver and so the food's sitting there which we, we always did that as a last case you know sometimes you got to do what you got to do right and so you know that's a real challenge and that's why in my opinion uber eats out of everybody has the biggest advantage um and that's and they are doing very well and they're growing rapidly because they already have all those drivers out there, right 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 and so it's easy for them to just be like oh you're driving around anyways looking for humans to drive around go take this order right right yeah that's tremendous. And I think what you've highlighted here is you contacted 200 people, you got four deals done over the space of, I'm assuming, a couple of years. It's hard work. I mean, acquisitions like that are really tough. It becomes a numbers game at some point in time. And you have to have a compelling enough story. And there's got to be a win-win on both sides. So that's, um, right. that's tremendous. Uh, so the other thing I want to talk to you about, which I really found interesting in getting to know you, is that while you were doing all of this, you had this plan for something else that you would do 
with the rest of your life. And, uh, in, and the reason I find it so interesting is many owners who sell their businesses wind up being remorseful and not because of the amount of money that they received for their business, but because they didn't have the next thing that they were going to go do or their business was such a big part of them that now they roll out of their business and they don't have any purpose and you know depression might set in or whatever happens. And it's a real thing because I have some personal friends right now that are going through this. They sold their businesses. They're young. They're in their 50s. They got a lot to do. And they're really struggling with what the next step is. And so I'm seeing it firsthand with some really close friends. But you didn't have that situation. You, you had a plan. And so why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing today? And then I want to wind back the clock a bit and talk about when did you start thinking about it? About it? How did you develop those thoughts? And, uh, and we can follow your journey. Yeah. No, so you're so right. You know, one of the things I, I, I tell people, which when you haven't, you know, hit it big, made it, whatever, hit that pot of gold, it's in our DNA to chase that, right? Like career, finances, that's, that's – I'll go into shortly. I have these five core areas that I, I've found everybody shares and are super important and you need to nurture it and find balance in all of them. But most of us just focus on that career and that finance one, you know, you, especially in our younger years, it's like, that's what it's all about. And I, I, I was, I was one of those. The good news is I was also using myself as a human science experiment and reading a ton of self-help books because somebody I didn't get into, but I hit my rock bottom in college. I was suicidal. I had, I had just, we moved around a lot. My mom was an alcoholic and, and it was abusive and, and, and my parents got divorced. So I was like your typical victim, sort of like life sucks, life's out to get me. My brain's broken. And college was kind of like my rock bottom. And fortunately, I serendipitously got turned onto a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Mr. Dale Carnegie, which was written, I think, all the way back in the 1930s. But you read it today and it still stands out as like, oh, this is an amazing book. And, you're, and other than some dated uh, references, which I think if you get the recent copy, they fix that. You might as well, somebody might as well wrote it yesterday. And that's what, it just clicked with me. Like there's universal principles in this world. And, you know, especially in this day and age, everybody's just grasping and looking for like, what's the answer? How do I be happy? And at the end of the day, that's all we want. We all just want to be happy. We all want to live our best possible time on this earth. So as I'm going through this journey uh, of my career in finances, which for sure took the center stage for a good part of my life. I realized how important these other areas were because I continued to read these self-help books and was trying to nurture my physical health, my relationships, my emotional health, um, you know, my mindset. And I realized that it was because I was nurturing those things, not despite of, that is, the, I think, the reason I became personally successful in my career in finance because they all kind of tie together. So in other words, my mindset, your mindset is your first core that I talk about. And it's the most important, in my opinion, because it's basically... Are you an owner of your life or are you a victim? Just like I had said, I started out this victim and I slowly started realizing it's up to me and I can be whoever I want. And you slowly start to take one step after another. You start to gain confidence, have success, gain more confidence and become this, you know, I, I realize I can do anything. Obstacles are temporary roadblocks, just waiting for solutions. I can kick ass, take names and there's nothing that's going to stop me. You know, and that's not something you can just flip a switch on. It takes, it takes time and, and building confidence and, and having successes. And so it's all kind of tied together. So when, I, when, when I'm exiting this, I've kind of been working on the side. Like I'm a crazy note taker, like literally I have thousands of pages of notes. Like I said, I, I would always write down, okay, this worked, this didn't. I read this over here. Let me try it in my own life. And I was like, I got to do something with this. And when, you know, we, we started to merge, I started thinking about it early on, you know, right when we started to merge, like, okay, this may be my, my chance to finally – write this book and get this information out there. I just had my first child who's now four. Um, and then now I have, now I have another son who's one, two boys. And I was like, if nothing else, these guys, I can give this information to them and I can hone this information into a simple system that they can use and help them to not have to go through the same thing that I did. That's amazing. So you had this plan all along before we get into it. I just got, I got to share this because that uh, is so surreal for me. I'm, I just turned 58 
there's only been one birthday that has ever really bothered me in my entire life. I, you know, 50, I'm bearing down on 60. I don't think it's going to bother me. 24, just for some reason, just bothered me. I was uncomfortable. I felt like I was sort of stagnating. I really didn't know what I was going to do. And I'll never forget this day. I took the day off from work and somehow or another, I rambled into a bookstore and I buy How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Read that book in one day and it changed the entire trajectory of my life completely. It's so funny that you mentioned that book. As you're ta- I didn't want to interrupt you as you were talking, but as you're talking about it, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it. What a great book. I've given it to my kids. Uh, I hope, I, I don't know that they've embraced it. I hope someday they'll read it. It really is a life changing book by guy. What was it written back in the fifties? Maybe. I mean, it's a long time ago. Or early forties. Early forties. Yeah. Right? I mean, a long time ago, but it's so true though, all the messages and uh, even to today. You know, that's so cool. And, you know, I love hearing that kind of stuff too. And, and, you know, self-help part of what I'm trying to do, I I call it the momentum movement. So it's all about building momentum in your life versus positive momentum. And I do this, I talk about it by doing it through habits in each of your five courses. So the system that we've gone through, um, the the schooling, the parents, the peers, the media, unfortunately it's, it's a bit broken in my opinion and it needs to be revamped and you develop these, what I call failure habits in each of these areas. And so the key to life, in my opinion, is putting a big spotlight on your life and saying, okay, what's, what's hurting me? What's not helping me in each of these areas? And how can I replace these, I call these failure habits, replace these with success habits that I can start building positive instead of negative momentum. And that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where in the book and what I talk about is it's, it's all about, as I said earlier, these universal principles that have been around since the beginning of man. They're going to be around till the end. You can't cheat the system. You can't work around them. You know, things like how to win friends and influence people. If I could sum up that whole book in one sentence, it would be stop, put, stop putting every, all the focus on yourself. Make the other person feel important and special. And you'll never have any problems with yeah. human beings again. And that is, that's yeah. it. Like, it's that simple. But it's like how we go about it, how we do it remembering that it's so it's in our DNA again to be selfish, you know, going back to caveman days, you know, we were surviving for food and whoever else is trying to get at our stuff, you know, we're, so even though we've evolved as a society, our brains still have that pr- primordial sort of, you know, me, 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 selfish type thing. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that doesn't serve us though in relationships and in business and these things. And those that can kind of rise above and see from that 10,000 foot view and tap into their higher versus their lower selves and legitimately put the focus, listen to what the other person's saying, be empathetic and make them feel special and say, how can we work together versus I'm here, and this is my ego and you're saying this and, you know, which is what most people do, which amazes me. Cause once which you is, kind of unfortunately out, we're watching this play out almost every day on Capitol Hill between the, the different exactly parties, right. you know, they can't, they can't get there because their egos uh, are too much in the way and, and they can't give in uh, you know, even an inch. And, you know, uh, the public's going to pay the price, unfortunately. Will, why don't we, that's a whole other topic. Let's not go there. Well, if you could just, if you could give a, an overview of your new entity and the, and the five components and, and how you, you know, how you approach folks. So, right. So kind of, as I briefly mentioned, so I, I look at everybody's life is composed of these five what I call cores, the main areas of your life. And it's your mindset, which I I briefly described. It's kind of your overall perception of the world. It's your attitude. It's your confidence. Is the glass half empty? Is it half full? Are you a victim in life that says, poor me, there's nothing I can do about it. My brain's broken. Or are you an owner that says, I'm an unstoppable force. I know that I have certain traits and awesome qualities. And yeah, there's certain things that I don't do so well, but everybody has that. I'm going to figure out how to do workarounds on those and focus on the stuff that I'm good at and kick ass take names then the next one is your career and your finances which as i mentioned earlier most people tend to spoke, spend the most time and that's not about what the mistake most people make is it's just about making money so if you're doing something where you're making a lot of money and you're not happy you're actually or you're not enjoying it or or you're, you're you're you know you're doing bad to the environment or to the world 
you can't get around the fact that it's not going to feel as good. You can try to convince yourself that the more money, and that's what most people do. Well, if I just make more, I'll feel better. That's not how it works. You got to have a purpose. You got to know what it is inside of your soul, your passion about what your strengths are. And you got to put those to work and start using those that when you wake up every morning, you're like, yes, I really like what I do. And are there going to be tough days and, and these things? Of course. But if overall you're loving what you're doing and you're figuring out how to make money doing that, you're going to be really good at it because of that, because this is something you're passionate about and it's going to separate you from the rest of the herd or instead of you trying to mimic other people. And the finance side of that is learning just basic stuff, how to, like I said, with rich debt, poor debt, passive income, using the law of compounding, investing, how to do it wisely. And, you know, looking at trends throughout, throughout the history of the stock market and the real estate market, instead of just blindly doing stupid things. So that's that. Then the next one is your relationships, which is essentially, we talked briefly about that as well. You know, it's, it's, and I break that into three categories, which is your acquaintances and colleagues or people that you kind of come across in life, you'd be a perfect example of that. Um, are you just looking down, you know, with your head down and, and are you looking at your phone? Are you smiling when you walk by people in the office? Are you trying to build connections, relationships, allies, which you don't know where they could lead? And oftentimes they'll end up becoming this amazing thing. Um, but most of us, you know, we do, we go through life like this. And then you've got your uh, friends and family, you know, and, and this day and age, unless it's your immediate family, a lot of people tend to just take friends for granted. They like their picture on Facebook or they'll send them a text once in a while. How, when's the last time you actually proactively got together with friends? You know, are, are you regularly incorporating that? Cause we need that face to face as humans. And obviously it's hard to do right now, but we also are fortunate. We at least have stuff like zoom and what we're doing to help, um, you know, get us through that. And then the last is your significant other. If you, you don't have to have one, in my opinion, to be happy. I, I know people that are single that are just seem just as happy. But if you do have one, how are you looking at that relationship? Are you a team? And you guys are, you know, going like this together. Uh, my hands are going together and you're, you're working. Or are you just butting heads and it's an ego, me versus you? And because you both came into this world with different backgrounds completely. You're not the same person. We forget that as humans and we want to force that person to see the way we see things and we just make assumptions and we do this and that's why people end up in divorce. So if you can kind of like, my wife and I have these things called agreements. It's sort of like, this is how I see the world. This is how you see the world. Let's agree to, let's see how we can merge the two because we kept having the same fights over and over and I read this book about it and it was like, okay, if we just, learn that you see it this way, I see it this way, and we can meet in the middle, boom, that argument goes away. And so yeah. that's a good example of just working together versus continuing your ego. Right. And the next one is your physical health, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, working out, eating, sleeping, exercising, these things. And what I tell people with that is don't try to go run a marathon if you hate running to be your exercise. Don't go to the gym if you hate weights, like do something that you enjoy. There's plenty of things to get your body moving yeah. that you can do that you like. My, my, my wife loves running and swimming. I hate both of those. I play basketball. I like to, to move that way. I, I go for long walks with my dog. You know, there's lots of different ways to get it done. Yeah. And same with eating. Like you don't have to just eat that stuff that tastes like cardboard because you think you should. There's plenty out there now that tastes good, that's good for you. You just got to do some research. And you can get it delivered to your door. And you can get delivered to <laughs> And then the last one is emotional health and giving back. So this is your, uh, are you running through life like a chicken with your head cut off, not enjoying life, like just with your head down, just like I got to get through life, I got to do the next to do. Or are you stepping back and saying, I love to play golf. I love to do this. I love to dance. I love to, and are you incorporating those things regularly, proactively in your life? Because if you don't put them on your calendar, as you, you know, especially you get kids, you start to get older, it doesn't just happen on its own. You got to make it happen, right? And so before you know it, you could be just working all the time and you haven't scheduled these things in your life. And so that's super important. And then also making sure that you know how to handle stress and decompressing and, and not dwelling on things. That's a whole, whole other section. And then the last one, the giving back part is, you know, what legacy are, are you leaving? Is the world going to be better or worse for having you in it? Yeah. You know, that, that's really the, the main question you want to ask. Am I doing good in this world? Are people going to look back and be like, ah, thank God he's gone. That guy sucked. He just sucked the soul, the energy. He was greedy, you know, or, you know, that guy did some really good things and, and he was trying to help and make people better. And he left a nice little legacy behind.
Yeah, yeah. And Will, how do you deliver this information? Do you do one-on-one coaching? Is it group coaching, masterminds? How are so you? Right now, I'm not even. I'm. I'm actually not making any money doing what I'm doing. There's like zero. There's so. I'm mainly focusing on working, finishing the book, and there's an app that I that um, is going to go along with the book that I'm super excited about. And the app is going to be essentially a way to gamify this entire experience to bring that younger generation. Like you said, you were 24. You're kind of like, where am I? What's going on? I, I want to tap in where, and I was suicidal right around 21. I want to tap into that younger generation that, that may have gone through a broken system that's just about to enter into the real world. And the app is gamified. You're a rocket ship. You have your five cores as the cylinders of your engine. And in order to fly off to the next planet, the next galaxy, be able to get through the asteroid fields, meet crazy aliens along the way, all these fun things, you have to figure out a way to balance your five cores and you have to make sure that you're firing on all cylinders. And the only way to do that is through these habits. And so the app has a fun way to sort of say, okay, what habits have you developed in each of these? Let's focus on just one at a time. You got to start small. If you try to do it all at once, it ain't going to happen. So you start very small on one little core on one little habit and you start to chip away on it. And the cool thing about habits, they don't care if they're good or bad, helping or hurting us. They're going to do their thing no matter what. So if we've developed a bad habit that's hurting us, building negative momentum, the the universe is just propelling us in that direction and our brain's trying to conserve energy. But if we're able to do some front loaded work and say, this is hurting me and it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to do some work to, to unhinge that habit that's dug its claws in deep then all of a sudden you replace it with something that is helping you, then that goes on to automatic as well. And it's actually helping you build positive. Momentum. Yeah. Well, I love your journey. Uh, yeah, I love how yeah, you built a business from scratch. You monetized it. You had an exit, but you also thought about what you were going to do next. And now you're making that happen. And so it's a great journey. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, it, the components of, of your framework, I think, are awesome and look forward to seeing that app. Will, if people wanted to get in touch with you, how could they reach you? So my website, www.more, M-O-O-R-E, Momentum, like my last name, moremomentum.com. Um, on Instagram, uh, it's Five Core Life. I think people will enjoy it. It's just daily kind of things like I'm talking about now and little, I like to try to add fun into it and help people learn lessons. But at the same time, like I said, with the gamification, having fun and becoming better versions of their selves, but not feeling like I'm getting some, some lesson from somebody. So uh, five core life with a spelled with a five, not, not spelled out F I B E at, so it's at five core life. Got it. Got it. Well, I really love the transparency, the information you shared, the authenticity, Really great stuff. Pleasure to have you here, Will. Thank you so much. This has really been a pleasure and I really appreciate you having me on. It means a lot. Thank you. All right, Will. Take care. That's it for today's episode of the Five Core Life Podcast with Will Moore, founder of More Momentum. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you have not already, please make sure to subscribe and follow the Five Core Life Podcast wherever you are listening or watching this so that you get notified when new episodes air every week. And if you have not, join the Five Core Life Facebook group. I encourage you to join that and see what all of the fuss is about. There's some awesome content designed to get your momentum going, including a monthly giveaway to win a complimentary coaching call with the Will Moore. The Facebook group is currently the only place to get Will's dedicated attention on your Five Core journey. If you're feeling stuck or just want someone to cheer you on, then that is the place you need to be. There's nothing like a community of people on the same journey to get you fired up, kicking butt, and taking names. So come join us. Well, get moving. Gain momentum. Join the movement. Join Emmett by going to moremomentum.com to take a free life evaluator quiz on where you currently stand in each of your five courses. 